In 30 minutes here on BBC Learning Zone. The light... One of the most significant contribution that television's made to the business of communication is to discover a handful of learned men who have the great gift of popularizing difficult, even obscure subjects. And such a man is my final guest tonight. In a series of films called The Ascent of Man, he traced our rise both as a species and as molders of our own environment and future and accomplished it in a compelling and fascinating style. We shouldn't have been surprised because in the early days of television, he was one of its first personalities. It's a curious counterpoint to his present position as director of the Council for Biology and Human Affairs at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies in San Diego, California. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Jacob Bronowski. Welcome. I mentioned there in the um, introduction the ascent of man. Um, can you recall, Professor, the, the first, very first moment you were first committed to thinking about what we are? Yes. It's a moment I speak about in the first program. Uh, I have been a mathematician most of my life, and it happens that um, I have proudly done a kind of mathematics that was invented by the Greeks. It's far less concerned with the numbers than with the shapes of things. One day, Le Gros Clark, a great anthropologist at Oxford, met me and said, I have a problem. Come and look at some teeth. And he showed me two sets of teeth and said, are those mathematically distinguishable or not? And I said, of course they are. The ones in your left hand are square and the ones in your right hand are triangular. <laughs> he said, why does every statistician tell me that they can't be told apart? I said, they can't be doing the right mathematics. I'll invent it for you. So I did the mathematics and it came out very well. It was only when I had begun it that I discovered that the dispute was about some teeth that had been found that were well over two million years old. They were the milk teeth of a disputed creature which had been found in South Africa. And the question was whether it was a monkey, whose teeth by and large are triangular, or whether it was on the way to being a human being whose teeth by and large are square. Well, after I and my colleague had finished the paper, no one could be in any doubt. And a new kind of um, statistics began to be used about anthropological measurement, and that was fine. But so far as I was concerned, that day in 1950 was a complete revelation to me. I had spent then some 40 years of my life doing abstract mathematics about a subject about which, if anything, I had been proud that it had been useless. <laughs> <laughs> proud for a very simple reason, because the only time anybody used me was during the war, and I wasn't a bit proud of that. And when I had come back from the war, when I had come back from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I had said that I would never do that kind of work again. And suddenly I was presented with an idea which worked about the life of man. Let's, uh, let's talk about something then that, that I know that uh, featured in the, uh, the Ascent of Man, and that's this thing about equality between men and women. Uh, it's fascinating reading your book, which has been written about the uh, series. Uh, I didn't realize that in fact, um, as a species, physically, we are closer together than any other, are we not? men and women. I mean, for instance, I didn't know that a woman um, in our species is the only female in any species to have an orgasm, which is extraordinary. I didn't know that. And we are the only species that copulate face to face. 
I ought, as usual, to say almost the only species in both cases. There are some aquatic mammals, like the whales and the seals, that find the other form inconvenient. <laughs> <laughs> And it is also true that it has recently been shown that some of the bigger monkeys, the females would be able to achieve orgasm, but don't in the wild because the males don't keep at it long enough. <laughs> Your, pardon me for cutting the scientific jargon and stating the plain. I, I, I much prefer it, sir, yes. <laughs> But, but where does that leave us then, though, in the, in the situation, though, uh, having uh, read this, established this, of the, of the so-called equality or inequality of the sexes? I mean, what conclusion do you arrive at? I think it's the most powerful thing that can possibly be said. It is quite clear that in the human species there is less difference between male and female than in any related species. For instance, you can tell a female chimpanzee from a male chimpanzee instantly because one weighs you know, about twice what the other does. You can tell a female gorilla from a male gorilla instantly. And their whole relationship is dominated by these physical differences. Human beings are extraordinarily alike, and that's not just a matter of the fashions of the last 10 years. <laughs> they have always been very much alike by comparison with their related species, that is, the large monkeys. Uh, moreover, they are much more alike in their emotions. Uh, you spoke about women having orgasms, but the fact is that women are also the only, um, almost the only creatures among the mammals that are sexually receptive at all times, as males are, that therefore do not come on heat as most other animals do, and that in general enjoy a position of intellectual equality, emotional equality with men. And that's been going on for over two million years. That didn't start <laughs> with women's lip. No, no. Uh, now I take that a little further. You're quoting from uh, program 12, the end of program 12, uh, which I happen personally to be in love with because I think that those few lucid phrases about women say so much more than uh, much else of the uh, science in the programs. Yeah. Women exercise as much choice in the male that they're going to mate with as do men. That's rare among animal species. And it means that from an early age the evolution of the human race has been mediated by the fact that women have looked for special skills in men and that men have had to be able to provide those skills. For instance, skill of hand, yes. manipulation of the hand by growth of the brain, uh, which have made the human race come on at such a tremendous rate. Mm. Yes. Can I talk to you uh, now about something that fascinated me um, in, your, in your series and in your book? And this is a, thing that's a theme that runs through your writing, which is the moral responsibility of the scientist. Now, you say that when you went to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that this was a, a crucial point in your life because this is when one presumes you say you, you said you'd take no further part in creating weapons of destruction and this sort of thing. Isn't it the ultimate tragedy, though, of all science that ultimately it is used to destroy? I wonder if I could begin just a little earlier with a, some biographical detail. Uh, I have lived, you have lived, most people here with us, here watching us, have lived through the two great catastrophes of the 20th century. The coming to power of Hitler in 1933 and the dropping of the atomic bombs in 1945. The two most ghastly events that have overtaken the human race, I think, in the last hundred years. Those two events made a deep impression on me because in 1933 I was still a pure mathematician, much devoted to the idea of doing mathematics. I had never done a broadcast, I had never done a public lecture, I had never spoken to anything but a class of students in rather professional terms. 
I was convinced in 1933 that if the German people had known my fellow scientists, had known the people that I loved and admired, like Einstein, like Max Born, like Niels Bohr, like a hundred others, had known them as I knew them, had known their wonderful warm humanity, that they could never have been deceived by a cold, brutal monomaniac like Hitler to learn to hate them as if they were vermin. And I was convinced at that moment that those of us who could had a duty to show not only that science was wonderful, but that science was human. That scientists had some right to say that they were doing the most human things in the world, the most natural things. And that we must stop being professionals and become people. But then, of course, I was even more shocked to find in 1945 that we had invented a means of re-establishing a distance between the technician and his victim by making these terrible things like bombs in which a man sits in a plane, or nowadays he sits in an underground silo, and he presses a button and says, hey, presto, and goes on munching his sandwich out of his brown paper bag while in Nagasaki, 40,000 people, and in Hiroshima, 80,000 people die in less than a second. So, my life has been much shaped by the fact that I have thought that my first moral duty was to make people warm and real about science and make science about people. Those are the two objectives I've had. I've spoken about them both now, because when I spoke about the little torn baby and its teeth, I spoke about making science about human beings. Now I've been speaking to you about making humanity understand what part science had to play. Then we come to the responsibility of the science. What should have been done in 1945? What should have been done between 1933 and 1945? I don't claim to have any answer about this. No one has. Einstein said at the end of his life, if I had known that the Germans were nowhere near making a bomb, I wouldn't have lifted a finger. Well, of course. You no, know, if the sky fell, we would all catch larks. If we all knew what God knows, then we would all act much more sensibly. But on the knowledge that we had in 1933, I am convinced that when 1939 came, we had to make bombs. That wasn't wrong. But with the knowledge we had, I'm equally convinced that in 1945, it was a crime to drop the bombs merely because we'd made them. What about the morality of the people uh, who had made them, the scientists? Uh, I mean, where, do you, where, do you, where does this morality begin? I mean, if, if you're in a situation where, being a scientist, you are the only one who knows the horror of what you're making, is there not a morality that says that, 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 that perhaps you should stop there and not let anybody know about it? I mean, isn't that a, a kind of morality? You see, I think that's the morality of Hitler. I think that's the morality to say, um, I'm a little god, I'm the dogmatist. All those people out there, all those people on the other side of this camera, they're just viewers, they don't count. I know what's good for humanity. I don't believe that. I know some things. And I try to tell other people what I think I know. And sometimes I persuade them, sometimes I fail. Mm. And sometimes it's better when I fail because I have never been wrong. <laughs> so I just don't believe that I would be willing to take on myself the burden for which, for instance, President Roosevelt had in fact been elected, namely the burden of how to run the war. My responsibility was the responsibility of any other soldier who was asked, put your skill to our use and let us decide how to use it. Now the question comes, should we not have urged Roosevelt, or rather, as it turned out, Truman, yes. should we not have <clears throat> urged Truman much harder not to drop the bombs? Well, I was not part of that particular setup, but I can tell you that my friends, Leo Zillard, at Wigner, that a whole body of people, 
at Los Alamos, sent around Robin and said to everybody, you don't know what you're doing, don't drop the bomb, and in any case, don't drop it against the Japanese. You have absolutely no moral justification. Nobody was ever talking about the Japanese being on the way to making one. It was a question of racing the Germans against making a bomb. Well, it's hard to stop at that stage. Yeah. It's hard to stop. At any rate, they failed. Yes. But that's, of course, why all of us became convinced afterwards that we were not going to make any more bombs. You know, the Salk Institute owes its existence to people like Leo Zillard and us who he converted, who said, we won't do any more physics anymore. No. We are going to f do a biological subject. But, but, but so, uh, you see, uh, isn't that a bit like saying uh, you have invented the wheel and thereafter you refuse to drive a motor car as a protest? I mean, isn't, isn't it a bit like that? You are asking scientists to be both the top minds at their subject and the top judges of how humanity, and particularly their nation in time of war, should act. Well, you, I think that's too much to ask. They have a lot of, there's a lot of precedent for it, isn't it? I mean, there's, you know, it's, it's, I think it's true, isn't it, particularly in times of war, God knows times of peace, that, I mean, there aren't many noble leaders, are there not many leaders who, given power, uh, massive power, uh, control it and, and act properly with it? I mean, isn't it the case that... I mean, I, all I'm saying is that <laughs> you seem a lot more optimistic about the human race than I do. Oh, I'm, I, I, I'm enormously optimistic about the human race because I think that the human race learns by making mistakes. It was a terrible mistake to kill 120,000 people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But by comparison with the mistakes that we have no doubt avoided as a result of having to use those bombs, I suspect that we may, may well have uh, prevented the use of one or two hydrogen bombs, which people will have been very tempted to use in the last few months. Yes, yes. I'm optimistic about the human race because I know nothing else but democracy which does what I believe must be done. That is, gives me the chance to persuade and gives others the chance to be persuaded or to refuse to be persuaded. Yes. This leads me on to actually to something that you said when I was reading through your cuttings. You said in 1957, uh, we cannot last for another 20 years if we go on as we are. Uh, are we going to make it? Are we, the human race, going to yes. make it? Yes. Are we, the Western tradition of Europe and America with its traditional values going to make it? That's a toss-up. That's a toss-up. Because we have become very uncertain. There has been a loss of nerve, a feeling that meditation will do instead of thought, that immersion in some great unknown will do instead of hard work. I'm a great believer in meditation because, you know, I never solved a mathematical problem without <coughs> meditating about it. But on the whole, I knew what I was meditating about. Yes. Meditating in the blank, I don't much care for. Um, and I'm very troubled by two failures. One is a loss of nerve, for which I hold a sort of post-war generation responsible. I don't think I contributed to that. But the other is, to which I and other scientists have contributed, for which I think we are responsible, is that as a result of the great successes of making planes and flying fast and making great machines and doing this, as a result of that, we have created in the public mind an image of the scientist as a man who is out to control the physical universe. I used to think that when I was a boy. Don't imagine for a moment I'm lecturing you because I, I knew better. I'm only saying this because I think I now know better. In my opinion, all the physics in the world has in the end, at this moment, added up to this, that we are beginning to understand more about the process of life. We are beginning to understand, first of all, what makes animals work, and then why human beings are so special. And that's what the ascent of man is about. Yes. You know, I've done many 
practical things in my life of which I'm very proud when I come to England now and see that you have the only perfect smokeless fuel in the world which I and my colleagues invented while we in America are still screaming about the environment, I'm very proud of my practical work. But if I look back on my lifetime and think of my theoretical work, this is what I'm proudest of. This is what I want to say to people now. Mm. In the last 20 years, and particularly in the last 10 years, we have begun to stand on the threshold of a very special subject. <coughs> Physics is about the laws of nature as they are from time immemorial. The life sciences are about the laws of nature as they are here, now, at this subtle, volatile, evanescent, untouchable moment. There will be different a moment before and different afterwards. You and I, speaking here to one another, are not two icicles who would have had the same shape five million years ago. You and I, sitting here five million years ago, would have been the parents of that little torn child and saying to one another, doesn't look like a very good monkey to me. Will he ever make it? <laughs> the fact is that life is new. Life itself is new. The life of the big apes is comparatively new. Human life is very new. Five million years or that order. And cultural life of human beings is only about 10,000 years old. In that time, we've come a tremendous way how have we been able to achieve this? You'll forgive me, you know, I'm a professional mathematician and figures mean so much to me, but when you think that there are at this moment, not a hundred yards from where we're sitting, ants, who have not changed one feature in the last 50 million years, whose structure is the same, whose behavior is the same, who cultivate the same aphids and milk them for their sustenance, and here we are, who in the trivial time of five million years of physical evolution and uh, 10,000 years of cultural evolution have come to this, communicate across thousands of miles, mm. speak languages with vocabularies of a million words, make these sh subtle shades of meaning. How have we done this? Those are the gifts that excite me. Yes. I don't want to know what I share with the rat and the dog. No. I want to know what makes me a man. Yes. But what about the future then? I mean, will it be um, um, in the future, would it be possible for you and I to sit here and talk without opening our mouths, to, try to communicate with each other? I think that we shall communicate much more easily than do we do now. I think that we shall have more subtle shades of meaning produced by fewer signals. That's certain, because you see, by comparison with the language of the chimpanzees, which is, you know, it's sort of real, but it only has kind of 40 words in it or thereabouts, uh, we are already able to give shades of meaning with a minimum of effort by tiny modulation. Uh, we shall improve on that. Is it absolutely without opening our mouths? Well, your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> Uh, will we become much better creatures? Yes, you know, I think that in fact we are nature's marvelous experiment. We are the first time that nature has discovered, I mean this quite literally, that you can improve the animal species not by the slow process of copulation, life and death, picking out the survivors, starting a fresh copulation, life and death, but by actual education, by doing what you and I are doing now by talking, by having people listen. That's the discovery that we have made, that the rational mind, sitting right here in those big frontal lobes, which are unique to us, or almost unique. Every scientific statement should be preceded by the word almost. Almost. I've noticed that, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> we are the new adventure. And I think we're only the beginning of that. I think that the animal world, in general, will be transformed over the next two million years or so a short time, yeah. over the next two million year, year, years or so, so that what we call intelligence, rational thought, and the emotions that go with it, the subtlety, the love, the friendship, the agglomeration of people, the cooperation, that the animals in general will move in that direction, 
and that mammals as they are at the moment with their uh, built-in instincts are on their way out exactly as the dinosaur was on its way out a hundred million years ago. Really? And are we finally, it's almost the end of our talk together, um, are we in fact clever enough, do you think, to um, go into the future and not and prevent making this planet of ours, or making ourselves, making this planet of ours uninhabitable as we're doing at present. I mean, the fact is we're raping the planet at present, aren't we? And there is a situation where if we don't uh, take, take steps, then we're going to be in desperate trouble. Do we have the sense, intelligence enough to realize this and to cope with it? You began the sentence by saying, are we clever enough? Mm. Now, to that, the answer is no. We are not going to save the planet, or we're not going to save the motor car, or we're not going to save Mr. Nixon, or we're not going to save <laughs> any other endangered species <laughs> by cleverness. And the sooner the endangered species learn this, the better for them. Are we warm enough? Are we human enough? Are we passionate enough? I heard an old interview with Zillard, who died when I first came to the Salk Institute last night. And he quoted a phrase in French which translated means, genius is sustained passion. And that's the right definition. Genius is not just a capacity for taking pains. It's not just being sustaining. It's sustained passion. Do we feel passionately enough? that the things we've made all the way from the bomb to this television set are there for good. Well, I think yes, I think we are passionate enough. Otherwise, why am I here? I say things which, by and large, nine people out of ten would just as soon not hear. But happily, one person out of ten says for me, in language that his and her neighbors understand much better than they understand my language, what I'm trying to say. And that's how what I have to say gets across. And I may as well take this moment to thank all those devoted viewers who are really doing my propaganda for me for what they're doing. But sustained passion is what is wanted, not just cleverness. Professor Brunofsky, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. That's it then until the uh, same time next week. See you then. Good night. And Dr. Bronowski's series, The Ascent of Man, begins at quarter to one next Friday morning in Open Science here on BBC Learning Zone.